invite today. Um, as is typical with these panels, um, I am awed and humbled by my co-panelists, and Topher and Melissa have accomplished that in spades. Um, I hope they'll live up to the example that they set. Um, you know, I, find, I founded SkyTruth uh, back in 2001 uh, in my basement in Arlington, Virginia. Um, I think, in fact, I bought this suit at about that time. Um, <laughs> One of the people from EDF in attendance uh, here who uh, I hope laughed at that comment as well um, is uh, VP, EDF VP David Festa. David, are you back there anywhere? David, there he is. Uh, I just wanted to thank David because without him, uh, I would never have gotten out of the basement. Um, David is a friend. <laughs> David is a friend and also was the founding uh, director and for many years um, chair of SkyTruth. And uh, David, your strategic thinking and um, more important moral support uh, is a big reason for why we're here today. So thank you. Um, and uh, so SkyTruth is a, a collection. Let me see if I can figure this out. Yeah, SkyTruth is a collection of um, data scientists, um, geospatial engineers, remote sensing specialists. Uh, I'm a geologist. Uh, and we specialize in using the view from space, uh, particularly as obtained by orbiting satellites, uh, to investigate and illustrate environmental issues and incidents around the world. Um, and, and also as a tool to inspire people to do something uh, to protect the environment. Here's uh, the bulk of our crew in our Shepherdstown, West Virginia office in the outer orbit of Washington, D.C. Uh, we also have staff in Oakland and Santa Fe and Portland and, uh, and in Jakarta. Um, and, and, and so we take advantage of all of this hardware that humanity has been flinging into space since the 1940s, uh, particularly over the last few decades governments and uh, private uh, commercial interests have been uh, launching satellites. Uh, at this point, there's some 1,800 active satellites in orbit. Uh, we've got big weather satellites and telecommunications satellites that are parked 22,000 miles above the equator in geospatial uh, or geosynchronous orbit. Um, and much closer to Earth, we've got this rapidly growing cloud of uh, satellites that are zipping by at 17,000 miles, uh, a few hundred miles up in, in what's called low Earth orbit. And in that group, uh, we have um, hundreds of Earth observation satellites. Uh, these are satellites that are equipped with sensor systems that are staring at the planet uh, and collecting images and other information about what's happening uh, down here on the surface. Uh, a lot of those Earth observation systems use, uh, are, are just capturing reflected sunlight that's bouncing off the surface. Uh, others, like this uh, Sentinel-1 radar satellite operated by the European Space Agency, uh, they're actually uh, shining a beam of radar energy down on the planet uh, to illuminate it. Well, we've been able to do some amazing things with these satellite systems uh, and, and illustrate the, the, the fascinating interconnectedness of, of various parts of Earth's operating system, uh, the big physical and, and biological uh, systems uh, that tie us all together. And, and just a few quick examples. This is one I really like um, that just shows the oscillating green up from northern to, to southern hemisphere of deciduous forests uh, with the seasons. Uh, this is a, 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 an integrated uh, look at um, atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide. Um, and at a glance, you can figure out which hemisphere is responsible for the bulk of the problem we're facing with this. Uh, it's not just carbon dioxide, there's also methane. Um, so here's a low resolution, fairly crude look at uh, global atmospheric methane. I understand that there's some environmental group that's going to be launching a methane satellite soon that's uh, going to greatly increase the detail and actionability of this picture, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so at SkyTruth, um, you know, we, we don't tend to do those big geophysical things with satellite imagery. We use satellite imagery in a very different way, and I'm just going to give you a few examples uh, and then a brief look into the very near future. Um, from the beginning, we've used satellite 
imagery as a tool for uh, acting as a kind of a global watchdog, uh, looking out over the actions or inactions, as the case may be, of, of government and industry and um, educating the public about what's happening. Um, and, and because satellites can see things happening anywhere on the planet, including right out in the middle of the ocean, uh, they're a very effective accountability and transparency tool. Um, and so one example that um, if you've heard of us, you may have heard of us because of this, uh, was during the BP spill in 2010. Uh, we started collecting free public satellite imagery of the incident uh, immediately. Um, within a few days, we were uh, measuring the size of the growing oil slick and publishing those measurements on our blog. By the end of the first week, uh, working in cooperation with a colleague of mine who's an oceanographer at Florida State University, we were able to make our own independent estimate of the rate at which oil was flowing out of BP's broken well on the seafloor. And our numbers shocked us because our estimate was 25 times greater than what BP was telling the public and telling the United States government. Um, Uh-oh. Did I kill it? BP's listening. <laughs> they're, still, they're not over it yet. Um, uh, well, so uh, by the end, we could conclude that by the end of the first week, that spill had actually exceeded the Exxon Valdez as the nation's worst oil spill. And when we said that out loud, uh, that attracted a lot of attention. Um, I, I like to think that the publicity from that actually prompted government science agencies, NOAA and the US Geological Survey to get engaged on this issue and to do their own uh, science to estimate how bad the oil spill was. They assembled a flow rate technical group and uh, after uh, three months of analysis on their part, their number was twice as big as our number was. Um, and I'm pleased that that has actually resulted in billions of dollars of restoration funding that is now flowing to the Gulf region to try to make it whole from this incident. Um, I think the, uh, oh, the other thing is, um, uh, you know, we really, I think, changed the public perception of how bad a modern deep water drilling spill could be and the risks associated with that. Um, but uh, although we still use satellite imagery on a daily basis at SkyTruth for this kind of a accountability and pollution monitoring work, increasingly we're looking for ways that we can build tools and approaches uh, to actually systematically mine satellite imagery for useful environmental information. And building ways to publish that and give it away for free to the world uh, so that it can support scientific research, uh, it can support um, good advocacy and, and public policy making, and just support enlightenment in general about what's happening on the surface of the planet. And so one example of that is an issue that we've been very interested in. It's the colossal global waste of natural gas. Um, and EDF has done, as you are well aware, some, some just phenomenal groundbreaking uh, scientific work on looking at one aspect of this problem, the fugitive emissions of methane, particularly from oil and gas infrastructure. Um, we're looking at the other half of the problem, which is the intentional burning of methane as a waste product to get rid of it. And this is typically done at uh, oil wells and uh, oil production facilities. Here's an example of a flare right next to a producing oil well. Um, and, and here's a view of a drilling site from above. Uh, we took this over the Bakken Shale in North Dakota from a weather balloon that we launched at dusk uh, that we strung a couple cameras on. Um, and what you see is a, is a big kind of rectangular drilling site. The big orange blob ball in the middle of it is a, is a large natural gas flare. And just below that is a bright white rectangle. That's the drill rig itself, which, and those things are illuminated like shopping malls uh, at night. Um, and using satellite imagery, a new kind of uh, special satellite imagery collected at night that collects information about the brightness of objects and their temperature, we were able to develop an algorithm to discriminate natural gas flares from other bright sources of light on the surface of the Earth. And once we have that process validated, 
uh, we were able to automate it. And this is the result. It's a global map of natural gas flaring around, you know, around the world. This shows the last 15 days worth of flaring events that we've detected. We also publish a companion data set. And the map and the data set are automatically updated every day. Um, I think I need to start charging for this because most of our users of this are actually um, commercial users, um, people in the commodities business, and, uh, and I need to figure out how to make some money off this. Uh, that's one thing I'm not very good at. Uh, <clears throat> So another example, it really helps uh, when you're a small nonprofit to have a big technology partner like Google. They're very generous uh, with their um, access to their enterprise level computing tools. Um, and, and one thing that's just revolutionized our ability to do our work is the advent of cloud computing, cloud storage and cloud analysis of data. Um, we can now access in the cloud literally millions of satellite images. And so one of the projects we're doing with this access takes a hard look at the practice of mountaintop removal mining for coal across all of Appalachia. Here's a photo of a typical uh, mountaintop mining operation in southern West Virginia. And our team is using this uh, tool called Google Earth Engine uh, to automatically analyze thousands of Landsat satellite images every year and create an annually updated map of the surface footprint of coal mining. Um, and there's a little snippet of computer code uh, attached there that I don't understand, um, but I threw that in there because my um, tech people really like it when I show some code. But here's the result. Um, this shows uh, 40 years worth of um, coal mining impact in an area that's about 200 miles across um, in south central West Virginia, captures a little bit of Virginia and Tennessee as well. Um, so you can see the inexorable spread of this surface landscape uh, disruption. We published this work at the end of July, um, and one of the uh, interesting findings from uh, our analysis was that in just the last 10 years alone, the amount of Appalachian uh, land that you need to destroy to mine a ton of coal has tripled in just 10 years. This is clearly the sign of um, financial doom <laughs> for the coal industry uh, in Appalachia. Uh, other researchers are using our data now to do studies that we hope are going to inform uh, the restoration and reclamation effort that this landscape deserves uh, and help the uh, economy of the region transition away from coal to something new and intentional. So, uh, I'm just going to wrap it up with a little crystal ball gazing. I have a lousy crystal ball. Um, it's hard for me to predict what's going to happen next week. Um, so it's going to be a very near future kind of discussion. Uh, but what is obviously happening in, in our business is this uh, boom in the space business. Um, you read about it every day now in your news feeds. Uh, Elon Musk is, is landing reusable rockets on um, drone uh, barges out in the middle of the ocean. And um, Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, he's got Blue Origins and he's landing big contracts for launching stuff for the military. And, and oh yes, by the way, he's running this thing called Amazon. So lots of new players are jumping into the space business and shaking it up. Governments around the world are launching their own Earth observation systems. And I'm not talking like France and Germany and Britain. I'm talking small countries are launching their own satellite systems. So um, there's a proliferation of, of hardware that's really uh, intimidating and kind of exciting. Here's a little example. I, sh I wish I could have brought one of these because I actually could have brought a satellite to show you today. Um, these are satellites manufactured by a company called Planet uh, out of the Bay Area. Um, they're imaging satellites. They figured out how to, out how to make these without any moving parts. Um, these are 18 inches long. They can make them by the dozen and fling them out into space. And if half of them fail, yeah, you make another dozen and fling some more out there. So uh, here, in fact, are two being booted out of the International Space Station a couple years ago and into orbit. This one company now has more than 170 imaging satellites in orbit around planet Earth. And they are collecting a complete portrait of all of the land area of the planet every day at a resolution of three to five meters. This is just revolutionary and kicks the door open for all kinds of potential monitoring applications and, and environmental projects. 
And so that's, this busy picture is getting even busier. Um, and uh, and for, a, for a, a geologist and a remote sensing person like me, this is, a, this is an interesting new problem. Um, for most of my professional career, my challenge has been the lack of imagery. It's been trying to find satellite images that cover the incidents and events and places where things are happening that I care about as an environmentalist. That problem has been totally turned on its head. Now I wake up every morning and go into the office and I say, okay, of the thousands of new satellite images of planet Earth that were collected yesterday, which 20 do I want to look at? Uh, it's a needle in a haystack problem. Um, as they say, this is a very good problem to have. And, and I think we're on the cusp of the solution to this. We're going to hear a lot more about this in the next session, so I'll wrap up with just a very brief taste. Artificial intelligence, the thing that is a fan of the Terminator movies, sometimes terrifies me, is also, I think, the key to a revolution in our ability to process satellite imagery, analyze it automatically, and inspire a new grassroots, tech-driven, environmental revolution around the world. Um, and, and, and so the application of artificial intelligence to the analysis of imagery is a thing called computer vision. And you'll be hearing a lot more about this. Um, and if you want a little taste of computer vision for yourself, I encourage you to go to the website of Descartes Labs. We're going to hear from Ryan right after the break from Descartes. Um, and try out this great thing they've got called the geovisual search tool. And it is fascinating and fun, and will give you a really quick introduction to the power and the potential of computer vision, and possibly also um, frustrate you a little bit uh, when you try to find things and, that it doesn't do such a great job at. And it will in, it'll let you know some of the challenges we're going to still need to solve to be able to broadly apply uh, this artificial intelligence-driven technique to um, environmental issues. Um, but, but I have to say, and, and you, we're hearing this again and again, we're on the cusp of, this is a revolution. These are great times. Um, these are great times. I mean, this is a really interesting and fascinating time when the, the blossoming of technology and, and the, the potential to mate that with environmental conservation and advocacy uh, is huge and is yet unmet. So there's a lot of great work for us to do. And, and I think the, the convergence of artificial intelligence with daily satellite imagery, crowdsourcing, and our ability to automate the alerting of people whenever we detect changes in the environment that they've told us they care about, changes like a, a new road being built in the rainforest that might be facilitating illegal logging, changes like a, a new gas drilling site in a wildlife refuge, um, or a mining operation that's going out of the bounds of its permit, we're going to be able to notify people quickly enough that if intervention is called for, intervention might actually be possible. Uh, and, and so I envision us creating a system, building a platform, that allows the whole world to monitor every protected area on the planet continuously, intelligently, automatically, every protected area on the planet, on land and at sea. So this is my dream. Um, and I'm starting to get evangelical, so I think I better um, stop and, uh, and get us to the break. Thank you. <laughs>